Chapter 4 The Divine Mission First Stage How Students Are Trained I always loved silent sadhana in seclusion. During the day for a short period I would write some articles and letters to thirsty aspirants. I did not use a kerosene light nor did I work at night at any time. I used to come out of my kuti just for an hour in the morning to serve the sick sick people with medicine for a brisk walk in the compound to bathe in the Ganga and to go to the Kshetra for bringing my food. This sort of routine has become my habit during my 35 years of life in Rishikesh. I never indulged in loose talks with friends. When I went to the Kshetra, I observed Mauna. To avoid people, I used to walk through a small footpath through, footpath through the jungle. While walking to the Kshetra, I combined deep breathing exercises and mental japa. I had no ambition to become world famous by any extensive tour or thrilling lectures from the platform. I never attempted to be a guru to anyone. I am not pleased when people call me Sadguru or Avtar. I am dead against Gurudom. That is a great obstacle and has caused the downfall of great men in spiritual path. Gurudom is a menace to society. Even now I ask people to do namaskar to me mentally. The few times I wrote to one of my disciples in 1931 convey my attitude clearly. I am only a common sadhu. I may not be able to help you much. Further, I do not make disciples. I can be your sincere friend till the end of my life. I do not like to keep persons by my side for a long time. I give lessons for a couple of months and ask my students to meditate in some solitary places in Kashmir or Uttarkashi. Reserve and Humility I never said or did anything to tempt people with promises of great results like Mukti from a drop of Kamandalu, water or Samadhi by a mere touch. I emphasized the importance of silence, sadhana, japa and meditation for a systematic progress in the spiritual path. Invariably, I asked all aspirants to purify the heart through selfless service to mankind. In 1933, the publishers in Madras wrote articles on my life and mentioned me as an avatar. Immediately, I gave a reply which explains the attitude I have always maintained. Kindly remove all Krishna avatar and Bhagavan business. Keep the publication natural and simple. Then it will be attractive. Do not exaggerate much about me very often. The juice will evaporate. Do not give me titles as World Teacher, Mandaleshwar and Bhagavan. Lay bare the truth. Truth will shine. I lead a simple and natural life. I take immense delight in service. Service has ele elevated me. Service has purified me. This body is meant for service. I live to serve everyone and make the world happy and cheerful. Even before donkeys and other animals, I do mental prostrations. To my disciples and devotees, I first do namaskara. I behold the essence behind all names and forms. That is real Vedanta in daily life. Guiding the steps of neophytes. From 1930, many earnest students with a burning desire to devote their lives to spiritual pursuits came to me for guidance. I had also a burning desire to serve the world. Those were the days when sadhus and mahatmas lived in peculiar pitiable conditions without necessary comforts and conveniences and proper guidance for spiritual evolution. Many tortured the body in the hot sun and in the Himalayan cold. Some were addicted to intoxicating drinks to induce the so-called samadhi. With a view to training a band of sannyasins and yogins on the right lines, I permitted some aspirants to live in the adjacent kutis. I arranged for their meals from the Kshetra and gave them initiation. I arranged all comforts and conveniences for them. I encouraged them and infused Vairagya in them. I took special care of their health. I frequently inquired about their sadhana and gave useful, useful hints for the removal of their difficulties and obstacles in their meditation. When they offered their services to me, I asked them to go from Kutir to Kutir and find out the old and sick Mahatmas and serve them with Bhakti and Shraddha by bringing food for them from the Kshetra and massaging 
their legs and washing their clothes. I asked some educated students to take copies of my short articles and send them to magazines and newspapers for publication and devote their time to study japa and meditation. They all took great pleasure in copying out my articles as they all contained the essence of the teachings of all sages and saints and a clear commentary on the difficult portions of the Upanishads and the Gita. My articles contain practical lessons for controlling the turbulent senses and fluctuation of the mind. Instead of studying the ancient sacred scriptures for decades, the students spent a few minutes daily in making co copies of my articles and thereby learnt yoga and philosophy easily in a short period. I closely observed their faces to see if they liked the work and then carefully selected matter suited to their taste and temperament and entrusted them with the work. Sometimes I had to do the whole work. I loved the students unasked I attended to their needs. In the case of old persons who had no ties in the world, I welcomed them and encouraged them in carrying on their sadhana and asked them to bath, to take bath in the Ganga and do plenty of japa and shravana. I danced in joy when I saw peace and bliss in their face. Thus more and more aspirants came to me and thus work ashram management could not maintain the increasing number of seekers after truth. I loved the place and enjoyed the peace, but in the interest of the spiritual uplift of a large number of educated sadhakas, I decided to leave the Swargashram. Planting of the Acorn Sapling Second Stage Planning and skipping, scheming were not in my nature. I depend on the grace of the Lord. I had decided to leave Swargashram. Where was I to go? That was a great problem. For some, days, for some days, I stayed in a small room at the Rama Ashram library. A few of my students lived in a small dharmashala nearby and depended on the Kshetra for their meals. For some days, I too went to the Kshetra for my bhiksha. To save time, I received my bhiksha through an elderly sadhu from the Kshetra. Thus months passed. Then I found a small kutir in a dilapidated condition nearby that was improved a bit by fixing doors and windows. I occupied the place and lived there for a period of over 8 years. I could have easily set up some thatched cottages in the jungle that was not suitable for dynamic work. Books and papers might get damaged by white ants. I saw a series of rooms in a dharamshala used by a shopkeeper as a cow shed. These rooms had no doors. Gradually, one by one, all the rooms were converted into residential quarters for the students. When devotees gave me some money for my personal use, I utilized it in printing leaflets like 20 important spiritual instructions, way to peace and bliss, 40 golden precepts and other pamphlets and gave them, and gave them to visitors. I utilized the money in purchasing some useful medicines for the treatment of sick Mahatmas and for postage to send articles to newspapers and letters to thirsty aspirants. The work grew in a steady pace. I did not go out in search of students. Truth seekers of truth came to me in large numbers seeking my help and guidance. They all received initiation from me and lived in the adjacent rooms of the dharamshala and worked day and night. To meet the heavy rush of work, I got a duplicator and a typewriter. People evinced great interest in the divine service done for the spiritual uplift of the world. I admired their devotion to me. In work, they forgot their past and plunged themselves in attaining evolution through service and sadhana. Devotees gave me voluntary contributions for the noble cause. For the maintenance of the students, I received dry rations for five persons from the Kali Kambali Wala Kshetra at Rishikesh. For the rest of the students and the visitors, I utilized the meager donation received from a few admirers. That enabled me to publish some books also for sale. Talents find their best uses. With the arrival of new and able hands, I started various fields of activities suited to their taste and temperament. 
I found out the talents and hidden faculties in them and encouraged them to a great extent. Then a small kitchen was started to provide food for the hard workers, the visitors and the helpless who could not get bhiksha from the kshetra. I maintained various kinds of addresses of devotees, high schools, libraries, donors and aspirants for the sannyas line. Nivritti Marg and sent my books periodically for dissemination of knowledge. The addresses were well classified under several headings for easy reference. Here I give the titles of a few address books. Ashrams, associations, advocates, judges, graduates, booksellers, publishers, firms, doctors, correspondents, students, divine life society branches, libraries, ladies, section, brahmacharis and sannyasi students, magazines and periodicals, maharajas and zamindars, students who have received initiation, monthly donors, household disciples, officers, patrons, professors, wonderful misers. Now there are several address books, a separate volume for each country. I myself used to fill in the correct addresses and note the changes very carefully. Even today I myself enter the important addresses and permit the students to maintain all the address books in perfect order. Third stage Birth of a great institution Systematically to carry on the divine mission on a large scale I established the Divine Life Trust Society in 1936 and registered the trust deed at Ambala. In 1936, when I was returning from Lahore after presiding over a Kirtan conference, I just thought of a trust society and alighted at Ambala and consulted an advocate and prepared the trust deed. Then the Divine Life Society was established for the dissemination of spiritual knowledge throughout the world and subsequently about 300 branches were opened in all important cities. Thousands of students received initiation from me into the order of sannyas. So long as they undergo training, they stay with me and work. Advanced students start their own mission in big cities or have their own sadhana in the Himalayan caves. Thirsty aspirants in all parts of the world receive guidance through post. Series of articles come out on the practical side of yoga, bhakti, vedanta and health through leaflets, pamphlets and bigger publications in various languages. Leading newspapers in all countries publish my articles on yoga, health and general spiritual matters. Half a dozen periodicals are published at the ashram in English and Hindi for circulation through the world. The ashram is now in a position to maintain about 400 persons learned and cultural, cultured scholars, mahatmas, yogins, devotees, poor people and the sick, not to mention the school students of the neighboring villages. A center of dynamic spiritual regeneration. Many foreigners come to the ashram and spend some weeks or months and admire the wonderful work turned out at the ashram. The inhabitants of Shivanand Nagar, young and old men and women enjoy the peace and bliss of this holy center and help the world in a variety of ways. They all receive my careful personal attention. I provide them with all comforts and conveniences and help them in their evolution. There are a number of buildings, kutis and guest houses for their stay. Over 30 typewriters work day and night for attending to correspondence and book work. The Yoga Vedanta Forest University trains a large number of students through able and qualified professors and teachers. The students become well versed in all the scriptures. The university press is now equipped with several electrically operated automatic machines of composing, printing, folding and binding. For the dissemination of knowledge among youths, essay competitions are conducted and scholarships offered to prosecute their studies in colleges and high schools. The Shivananda hospital is a blessing to the Mahatmas, Yogins, pilgrims and the poor people of the neighboring villages. Experienced doctors in different systems of medicine attend to the hospital work. The general hospital is equipped with modern apparatus like X-ray, diathermy and a high frequency apparatus for ENT and eye cases. Special worship in the Lord Vishwanath Mandir has given a new life to the sick persons all over the world. People get peace and prosperity by such worship done in the name of the devotees. I am filled with immense joy when I receive hundreds of letters from devotees who say that their lives were saved through the special prayers 
prayers conducted in the temple of all faiths at the ashram. They write volumes on the miraculous escapes they had in their lives. Leaders and followers of other religions and cults also come and stay at the ashram and find this an ideal center, a common platform to serve the world. I see before me a huge spiritual colony with joy and bliss in the face of every resident. People come with many motives such as attaining material and spiritual benefits and they are all stunned to have their wishes fulfilled in a large measure. Glory to the Lord for bestowing this ideal center for all types of seekers after truth. In addition to the normal activities, occasional blind relief camps are organized at the ashram and at outstations also. Provincial Divine Life Conferences are organized in important cities of India. Devotees and students come in batches during their holidays and join the daily routine and satsang and derive incalculable spiritual benefits. Fourth stage, Collective Sadhana Young aspirants, because of old, old habit, used to sleep in the winter cold tins till sunrise or till 6 or 7 in the morning. They must not waste their precious life in sleeping in the Brahma Murata between 4 and 6 in the early morning. That period is highly favorable for deep meditation. The atmosphere also is charged with sattvic vibrations. Without much effort, one can have wonderful concentration at this period. From my kutir, I used to chant aloud several times the mantras Om, 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 Sham, 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 Radhe Sham, Radhe Sham, Radhe Sham, and thus made my students get up early for prayers and meditation. This had no effect on the tamsic type of aspirants. I arranged their night meals before sunset. That enabled some to get up early morning. It is only those who load the stomach heavily at night that find it difficult to get up early in the morning. In the beginning stages of sadhana, even if people meditate alone in a room, they get up in the morning only to see that they were overpowered by sleep and sleep the whole period in a sitting posture. This gave me an idea of a common prayer and meditation during Brahma Murta. One student would ring the bell in front of every kutir and collect the aspirants in a common place for the collective sadhana. I joined the group daily for some months and years. Prayer and study classes The function started with prayers to Lord Ganesha, Guru Stotra and Mahamantra Kirtans. One student would read a chapter of the Gita and explain the meaning of one shloka. Another student gave some short hints on concentration and meditation. In the end, I spoke for half an hour on, on attaining quick spiritual progress and suggested various methods for destroying the evil tendencies of the mind and controlling the turbulent senses. I laid great emphasis on ethical perfection. The function came to an end with the chanting of 10 Santi Mantras in Chorus. The students kept up the divine consciousness even during their work in the day. Some students lived in Brahmanand Ashram, a furlong away from my kutir. On many occasions, I paid surprise visits to the kutirs at 4 am and chanted Om several times and made them get up for prayers. I did not compel all the students to join the common meditation. I permitted them to have their own sadhana in their own kutis. Thus I paid all my attention to the spiritual uplift of my students. Even now many students who attended in those days the common prayer and meditation say how they were inspired by my short speeches on sadhana. If the, in the evening also I organized a study class between 3 and 4. I asked one student to read a chapter from any of my books. On the next day I used to put questions on the important points. I trained the aspirants in a variety of ways. They all specialized in chanting the mantras of the scriptures, conducting kirtans, delivering short lectures. I asked one student to put questions and others to answer them. In the evening class I introduced Likhita Japa and in the early morning Trataka and other yoga exercises. During the day, they should all prepare essays on yoga and philosophy and write about their own experiences. Even today, when school boys and young children come to the ashram, I teach them a few short sentences in English and ask them to deliver a powerful lecture. Many have learnt my English kirtans, kirtans like Eat a Little. I train my students in organizational work, typing, maintaining proper accounts, managing the affairs of the society and 
in attending to the devotees, visitors and the sick. Thus, even in the early stages, the Yoga Vedanta Forest University was vigorously in its working. Attention to visitors When visitors came to me, instead of talking to them on their family affairs, I asked them to forget the past and sing Kirtans with me. I taught them music, bhajan, kirtan and philosophy. Even today when devotees come to the ashram, I prescribe a book for their study. I prescribe a book for their study and on the next day I ask them questions. I clear all their doubts and give helpful suggestions for the removal of their, of their troubles and obstacles. They all feel happy in receiving my personal attention. The systemic the systematic work done at this sacred center in the Himalayas on the banks of the Ganga attracted thousands of seekers of the truth from all distant places in India and other countries. The Divine Life Society, the Yoga Vedanta Forest University and the Sivananda Ashram became watchwords for all aspirants. Similar work is now organized systematically in various centers with the formation of branches of the university, the Divine Life Society, Sivananda Ashram and Sivananda School of Yoga. I pay much attention to the right of the aspirants at the ashram. Here they have enough to keep themselves quite fit, not for luxury or craving of the senses, but helpful items for progressing in sadhana. I introduced saltless diet on Sundays, simple boiled potatoes and bread on Ekadashi days, or only milk and fruits for some students. I started the work with a, do with a dozen students. In a short period, a large number of devotees came to me during holidays from Delhi, Madras, Calcutta and other cities in India. Then I introduced a collective sadhana, a special program with the important items of sadhana, a kind of spiritual conference on the practical side of yoga. This took the shape of sadhana weeks during Easter and Christmas holidays and now this has become a regular feature during the last 20 years. Various branches of the Divine Life Society in India organize similar conferences with the routine of the Sadhana Week at the Ashram. They invite great men to deliver lectures during these conferences. They print several leaflets, pamphlets and books for free distribution on the occasion. Thus there is a dynamic work for spiritual awakening all over the world.